Jay Robinson joins the Plutopia podcast this time as we discuss artificial intelligence and its impact on society. One issue generating a lot of controversy is AI and copyright infringement. You collect a lot of text that is relevant to what you want this large language model to understand. And these general purpose large language models basically just want a lot of things that people have written. Ideally, things that people have written well, and ideally things that are, <laughs> yeah, copyright is fun there. Um, <laughs> but ideally things that every, every you know, original work of authorship is, is covered by copyright as soon as it's committed to a tangible medium. Um, but what those copyrights are varies from work to work and how long they last. Depends on whether you're Disney, in which case they last forever, or just a person, in which case they last until Disney can steal it. Um, but, uh, so copyright applies to everything people have written. Copyright is untested waters uh, as compared to what machines have written. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of the Plutopia News Network podcast. Our guest today, oh, I should introduce myself. I'm John Lepkowski, and my partner over there is Scoop Sweeney. And our guest today is Jay Robinson. Jay is a bon vivant, and has been an army medic, a Navy diver, a Texas lawyer, believe it or not, in the past, polyparent.com dilettante, and in that little summary, he also added that he's queer and salty as fuck. So there we are. Let's go, man. How you doing, Jay? I'm I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, you know, work remains interesting, which is the most any of us can ask from this capitalist hellscape we're in, and it and it pays well. How could it not be interesting? You're right in the middle of the sexiest technology I around. I, yeah. I remember when DOS came out and I thought, damn it, I have missed the whole revolution. You know, the whole PC thing. I was a little young. I didn't write any of that stuff. And here I am at the other end of, uh, you know, half a century thinking, oh, no, I'm at the hottest AI company doing the hottest AI stuff. I'm AI is kind of a stupid name for it. Uh, it's, it's, it's nothing like intelligence, but we've gotten very good at language manipulation, programmatic right. language generation and language manipulation. Uh, I don't think Alan Turing really proposed the Turing test as a test of intelligence. Um, and it was never a good idea. Uh, like it's not a test of intelligence. Language is a trick. Uh, it's, it, it's a trick for humans and it's a, fundamentally different trick for machines but it's a relatively simple trick on the scale of you know being smart well i've noticed that chat gpt doesn't have seem to have as much soul as robbie the robot did no well that's because robbie's lines were written by people um yeah <laughs> and, and actually, because robbie could synthesize alcohol right right well that's key yeah. is synthesizing the alcohol that's uh <laughs> that was the good early trick we figured out so well, so when you and I first met, you were an attorney, and now you're a guy working with AI. How do you make that journey from being an attorney in Texas to being a guy out in uh, the Bay Area working with art so-called artificial intelligence? Well, so I was a child support lawyer in Texas, and Texas did a remarkable thing. They elected a corrupt attorney general, um, and that corrupt attorney general had my incorruptible boss walked out one day, and I was uh, not happy about that. And so I went to work for Steve Jackson Games um, as a kind of hybrid uh, general counsel slash chief information officer because I've been playing with computers for a long time, and I like playing with them. And from there, I went to work for um, an internet uh, or a, a dot com called Quadrilay. They were a company who licensed the um, NCSA Mosaic code. This was before the web was a thing, when all of the internet was text-based, Usenet, IRC stuff. And um, NCSA Mosaic was the first web browser. And so what they wrote was software that would take desktop publishing documents from a thing like Greenleaf FrameMaker and um, convert it to HTML 
and index it. So you could take this set of documents that was like a whole bookshelf, like Cisco I iOS, and, and put it on a CD or a stack of floppies with an index that made it searchable and it would render it out as HTML in the built-in included Mosaic web browser. So this was one of the early uses of web browser technology and it was not meant to be networked. It was, um, you know, desktop web browsing for desktop documents. Um, and I believe they got acquired by Adobe at some point. And from then I went to work as a, and I was just a system administrator there. And then I went to work for Excite um, back before they merged with At Home, one of the early web portals like Yahoo. Um, then they merged with At Home and then AT&T coveted At Home's networking backbone and they were on the board. So they pushed Excite at Home into bankruptcy and essentially stole the backbone from, you know, the the people who owned the bankrupt entity um, paid pennies on the dollar for it. Um, and after Excite, I went to work for different internet companies. Um, before this company, I was at a company called Itabon, and they were a natural language processing company, and they um, were some very smart natural language processing data science people out of Stanford. They didn't get around to hiring any very smart business people to make a company do all the things that a business company has to do. Um, but one of the things we did was we hired a data scientist. Uh, we poached her away from HEB and persuaded her to move out to the West Coast. And then she went to work for my current company. Um, and after that company, after Itabon drove off a cliff and I was just sort of looking for work. And one day out of the blue, she kind of phones me up and says, you really need to have coffee with my boss. He's this fascinating guy. And, and he was a fascinating guy. He's still my boss, probably the smartest guy I ever worked for. Um, I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was just coffee over on South Park. And, and I loved having lunch with him. And like a couple of days later, he phones me up and he says, you, you, you need to come work here. And, you know, my, my first paycheck was uh, written on somebody's personal account. It was like a paper check signed by a person made out by hand. And, um, but one thing and another, and, you know, now we're, uh, we're the it company in generative AI. Yeah. You mentioned natural language processing. And I guess, I mean, you said earlier that AI is not the best label for what we're talking yeah. about i guess natural language processing that, is better that that does describe what's going on and it is the use of you know computers and programmatic techniques to uh both consume natural language and produce output in natural language and so you know if anybody's played with copilot to generate code it does a pretty good job because it has ingested a lot of code um and so these, and, and there are a whole host of tools besides large language models that are used in natural language processing, which is one of the things that it's easy for people to get confused about. You know, you think of chat GPT as being, you know, uh, this large language model and it's the thing. Um, but what makes a large language model hum is carefully crafting the prompt um, which is the question or the set of instructions that you have. Uh, and you use a whole bunch of different tools to programmatically put together a prompt for the particular large language model, and then to programmatically slice and dice and shape the response from the large language model. So the, the large language model kind of is the thing that sits in the middle of this whole chain of information that gets fed to it and post-processing that happens after the fact. How do you tr how do you train the large language model? Do, do, is, it, yeah. is it similar to what uh, chat GPT does? Yeah, well, it, they're, they're all trained kind of the same. You collect a lot of text that is relevant to what you want this large language model to understand. And these general purpose large language models basically just want a lot of things that people have written. Ideally, things that people have written well, and ideally things that are, <laughs> yeah, copyright is fun there. Um, <laughs> but ideally things that every, every you know, original work of authorship is, is covered by copyright as soon as it's committed to a tangible medium. Um, but what those copyrights are varies from work to work and how long they last. Depends on whether you're Disney, in which case they last 
forever or just a person in which case they last until Disney can steal it. Um, but uh, so copyright applies to everything people have written. Copyright is untested waters uh, as compared to what machines have written. Um, clearly, there is some flavor of derivative work going on here. Um, different companies use different techniques to um, either try and keep their data as polite as possible with respect to respecting copyright or not. And, and so some companies right now who have just blatantly scraped the New York Times and anything they can find on the web and baked that into their large language models are having some legal challenges. Um, and, yeah. Have, have there been any, any uh, court cases that have actually been decided on that particular point? There have, and I cannot name them. Um, I, uh, I stopped practicing law because I found it mind-numbingly tedious, but I do hang out with our general counsel on the regular, um, but I don't pay attention to the details beyond. Do I need to be doing something different with our data handling so that we are further down the line of people to sue. Um, it used to be very easy because we had very shallow pockets, so we were never going to get sued, but now we're making money. Um, so, but we've always been as careful as I know how to be. Um, we use stuff that's publicly available or stuff that we've purchased. Um, and we explicitly don't use the kind of stuff that people worry about that mostly today. So what, so, so the, the company training, you work for yeah, is to your original question. So we take oh, okay. all this data and then we build a statistical model. And essentially here is everything that a large language model does. You give it a bunch of words and it tells you the most likely next word. And then it repeats that. That's it. That's what an LLM does. And it, and most likely based on having read a lot of words. Um, written in your target language or collection of languages. They also do cross-language stuff. So it really is, in a sense, Searle's Chinese room perfectly executed. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that that the output of those things can sound as real and reasonable as they do, even though you do find that they, well, people say hallucinate, but you say confabulate is a better word for that. Much better word for this. When... When people hallucinate, they believe things, they believe they've perceived things that they have not perceived. When people confabulate, they say things they believe to be true that are in fact not true. And there's all kinds of fascinating stuff about blind people who don't know they're blind talking about what they see based on other evidence and, and you know, hilarity ensues. And that's what large language models do. They don't know anything. They don't have opinions. They cannot lie because in order to lie, you have to be telling a deliberate mistruth and language models have no concept of truth. So, you know, they just, the most likely next word based on all the words they've read, that's that's the trick. Yeah, I mean, basically what they do is in the way that they put information together, there's no assessment of truth. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no judgment on their part. Exactly, and, and no ability to judge. Um, and one of the things that, that we do is um, we flag up anything that appears to be a, a claim of fact. And we will highlight that. Um, and we're very much about human in the loop um, and say, this is a claim of fact. Uh, you need to verify it with somebody who knows the difference between fact and fiction. Yeah, I'm glad you say that. I've always thought, and I have always preached if we were talking about AI, that there kind of needs to be a human in the loop if there's any high stakes for what the AI is doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that should probably may remain true, you know, for a long time. When I was in law school, I took a class on AI and the law. Um, and, and we talked about, and back then AI was expert systems. And expert systems are basically binary decision trees and subject to the foibles of binary decision trees. But, um, but yeah, then it, like everybody involved with making rules for humans and enforcing those rules, whether those are, uh, you know, legal rules or hiring rules or any other high stakes, I think you, you, that you, 
I think your characterization is probably best. High stakes decisions about people ultimately need to be made about people with enough insight to understand, uh, you know, when terrible things are being promulgated. Do you encounter problems with grammar, proper grammar? No, grammar is pretty easy. Um, and, and, and grammar is fascinating. That's where we get all of our good linguists because the, the linguists love grammar. Um, and, and like not prescriptivist grammar, but descriptivist grammar, which is what makes it so fascinating because grammar is not a rules driven system. Grammar is a practice driven system. Um, and, and so it's a little bit fluid, which is why, you know, old English and middle English and modern English are so far apart, even within one language family. And then you look at weird language families like Hungarian and languages that have gender and that don't languages that have 127 cases and languages that have two. Um, and the way we, the amount of semantic content that's contained in things like word order or case or gender is it's large. So, so grammar is, is the source of a lot of meaning and it is only by consensus, really like words mean what people mostly agree that they mean. Um, and, and sentences mean what people understand them to mean. So if I want you to understand something that I'm saying, it's incumbent on me to say that in a way that you'll understand what I mean. Um, and, and that's a remarkably complicated dance. But by observing that dance, uh, natural language systems, which don't have to care about what the rules are or anything else like that, say, can say, well, I've read a lot of words. And this is what pe this is, these are the words that are used in these circumstances. In response to those words, people mostly say these words. And because what large language models can do is look at a huge sample of language, like our language models have seen more words than I will ever read in my life. And I read a lot. Um, and So, and so are, are you saying that you don't really have to program a set of grammatical rules because... Oh, absolutely not. Model. You don't. Those that are is. in the models. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And, and like... Grammarly was an early player. Um, we started out doing localization, which was translation work um, from, you know, one language to another. We had customers who wanted to sell in other markets and they wanted good looking translations, not funny translations. And, you know, if, if you do translation carelessly, you get hilarious jokes. And if you do it carefully, then you get good, you get marketing collateral that works across different language groups. Um, and from there, we moved on to grammar primarily in English, because that is, as it turns out, the lingua franca of the world. Um, and so, and now we do generative AI. Uh, we also do grammar and spelling and case and those are all sort of different tools within our collection of tools. And it's a constant conversation. Do we want to do spelling first or grammar first? Or when punctuation is in disagreement with spelling, how do we break that tie? Um, and so, which is what makes doing generative AI in general hard is it's not just the large language model, which is expensive to train. It's all these other parts and how you string them together. So what are some of the use cases that you serve with generative AI? So it's funny, I follow uh, a ton of writers and, and I agree with like the Hollywood Writers Guild that, that generative AI is gonna be bad for them and it's also gonna be bad for fiction. And so all these writers write because they love to write and they have stories that they wanna tell and they don't want computers doing that because they wanna be doing it. That is not the majority of writing that happens in the world. The majority of writing that happens in the world are things like, um, you know, ISO compliant security policies. And those have to be written in, uh, you know, specific weird language that nobody enjoys writing. Um, and uh, some, some people have to write marketing collateral. If you're, uh, you know, a lingerie company and you have to describe underpants, except that you have to describe underpants 20 times a week, every week for the rest of your life in ways that are fun and engaging. Like that's, that's, 
that's not work that people want to be doing. So if you give them a tool to bang out 20 different descriptions of underpants and then they can work with that material instead of having to pull out yet another way to talk about underpants out of their head, that makes their job less agonizing. It's the grunt work. And there is a lot of grunt work in writing. Um, and we pay people a lot of money to do it and they don't like doing it um, a lot. And so that's our biggest market really is people who have stuff they got to write that they'd rather not write that um, in, you know, at scale. Did you have different language models for different, uh, different sectors? We do um, like, and, and that is like, and those can be smaller, which is helpful. Like we have a medical model and we have a financial model because as it turns out, uh, those people have a lot of money and that's why we do this. Um, but yes, it can be beneficial to train smaller models with a more focused area. Well, so you uh, are creating a language and is this going to be fed to other AIs that are going to do something with it? And is there a risk of, it's like when you copy something and it fades a little or changes a okay, little. Different question than I was about to answer. Um, fidelity is not a thing and, and people have a hard time with that. If you ask, uh, let's, let's just call them, uh, language systems. Uh, if you ask a language system, a question, and then you ask them that same question again, you're going to get a different answer. And some people really don't like that. Um, but that's how these things work. Um, it's not, uh, but it's not blurrier. It's just different. So, so if you ask the same question a lot of times and superimpose those answers, it, you get the same kind of result as if you superimpose a lot of faces on one image. And so you get that average answer that, that is sharp and sort of the perfect person. If you average enough human faces, you get faces that we think of as attractive. Um, if you were to superimpose these, this variety of answers, you would have sort of a strong overlap in the middle with some outliers around the edges, as opposed to getting blurrier and blurrier the way it does with successive copies. Where I thought you were going with that is what I think is probably going to be the real AI apocalypse. So I'm using AI to generate all of these um, compliance required policies and documents and stuff like that. It turns out not only are, they, are these things horrible to write, they're horrible to read. And so the person at the other end is going to feed it to their AI and their AI is going to read it. And then these two AIs are going to heat up a lot of GPUs having this conversation that is utterly irrelevant to a single legitimate human interest. Um, well, the uh, old uh, test of putting people in a circle and telling one person a secret and they're supposed to whisper it to the person yeah. next. And that always is a, a, a if you pardon the, uh, the, the words, it always end up, ends up being a clusterfuck. Yeah, it does. Um, and, and there will certainly be that kind of thing. If you put a bunch of AIs in a circle, but it's not, the thing I, I don't worry so much about the stupid things that these machines are going to say, I mostly worry about the waste in having these machines perform this ultimately useless task. Um, and, you know, as Moore's law continues more or less unabated, um, we get better at managing energy um, and it'll be a little bit of a foot race between whether the Western shelf slides off of Antarctica and inundates most coastal areas, or we figure out carbon first. Um, but I, I don't think like wasting compute on foolish tasks, um, AI has yet to catch up with proof of work in crypto scams, um, but we might, we probably will. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been wondering about that. I, I, people are kind of freaking out about the energy footprint of AI systems, and I can't help but think that those will become more efficient. I mean, when you Absolutely. have a problem like that, you work on resolving it, right? Yeah, and and we already actually have the solutions. Like, if we had stayed on nuclear fission in the '70s when it was the hope of all mankind, we wouldn't be here today. 
Um, modern nuclear power is extremely safe and it does not produce toxins forever. Like if you want toxins forever, look at arsenic and PCBs and stuff like that. Um, nuclear waste is a solved problem. Nuclear fission is a solved problem. Nuclear fusion is hilarious to me. Uh, my mom used to be a tech editor for Princeton Plasma Physics and Lawrence Livermore. And so I saw a lot of their early work in the 70s and it was just, uh, it's the same work today. <laughs> well, you know, James Lovelock wrote a lot about um, small nukes. Yeah. Uh, and he was like the gay hypothesis guy. I mean, he was not exactly the kind of guy you yeah. would think of to like, advocate it, for it, something toxic. So if, if what's his face over it, the face thing, you know, wants a nuke to drive his AI, I'm all in favor. Um that you still have the heat to deal with, but there, even that. I'm not sure about buying Three Mile Island, though. Who well, was, it? was it? Microsoft that's doing that? I Oh, right, right. Somebody wants to open TMI again, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, um, yeah. Everybody's worried about oversight, but the nuclear industry is is extremely well regulated. A guy I worked with at, um, at SJ Games, he might have been on the EFF board. Do you remember Bob Apthorpe? Uh, uh, vaguely, Bob yeah. As Arclight. So anywhere you see arc light, well, when Fukushima melted down, he had gone back to the nuclear industry from working at Excite and uh, CNN got him on a Zoom call like this to talk about Fukushima. And he rattled on about, you know, nuclear energy and this and that until his boss phoned him up and said, Bob, you got to stop. <laughs> Shit. But uh, yeah, that was uh, good times. Well, yeah, I mean, I I don't worry as much about nuclear energy myself. I know there's still a lot of people who, you know, get the willies when they hear about it. But you don't have to make these huge nuclear plants. You can make smaller, smaller nukes. Small right? plants and, and, you know, breeder reactors and, you know, liquid salt reactors. Yeah, we know how to make really good nukes and they don't have to be big. Um, and between that and like the improving efficiencies in photovoltaics and the discovery that lithium is not particularly scarce. Um, like the salt and sea is sitting on top of more lithium than we've ever used. Um, and brine extraction works for that. They just found a giant, you know, pile of lithium somewhere in the Appalachians. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, extractive technologies are inherently non-renewable. On the other hand, you know, elements are elements and, you know, you configure them in ways that are more interesting or less interesting. You mentioned that you were using uh, uh, or focusing on medical uh, uses of the of AI. And yeah. uh, I worked in uh, medical IT for Kaiser Permanente for about three decades uh -huh. in the Bay Area. And so I had to deal with things like HIPAA and Sarbanes Oxley, and they were very strict and very subject to you know, severe penalties if you transgress. And how how are how will you deal with making sure you're not breaking any of those rules? Well, we already do. Uh, I'm completely familiar with HIPAA. Uh, I I um, am also a Kaiser patient. Uh, go Kaiser. Um, like it's not military medicine, but which is my model of how all medicine kind of ought to be good enough medicine for everybody at whatever the most efficient price point is, and you don't charge them for it, um, which isn't quite how Kaiser does it because they are a for-profit company. Um, okay, HIPAA. Um, HIPAA compliance is fairly straightforward. Uh, thing one, we do not maintain any of this data as records. So if you are... Um, Kaiser, and you want to write up your patient notes, you send me a bunch of free text. And that free text is chock full of protected health information. Um, that protective health information, however, is like we process the text and we fix your grammar. We tell you a nice way to tell somebody they're, um, you know, not going to see their next birthday or whatever it is. And then you, as the practitioner, get this information back from us and you um, include it in the patient record or whatever you want to do. Um, on our side, none of that is a record and we don't let anybody else see it anyway. It doesn't matter whether you're, we don't care what that text is. Um, so we are not 
uh, a data controller for any of this personal health information. Um, it passes through our system securely in and out. And so that's how we stay HIPAA compliant. Um, you're not a computer, you're a typewriter. Right. Got it. And, and you can't query any part of my system and say, tell me about patient Bob. Um, because we don't store data that way. Uh, how would you feel about having, uh, let's say you go to the, to a physician's office and they sit you down and, and they start feeding everything you're saying into, uh, into a computer and then basically use the computer to do the diagnostics, you know, use I, an AI if, system. If the computer does diagnostics, you know, on par mm -hmm. with the doctor. Um, I, I don't care how they do the diagnostics. I care if the diagnosis is correct and the proposed treatments are correct. But you want the doctor to have evaluated that. For treatments? I Yeah. Only right. kind of. Like, doctors aren't really all that great. Um, I, was a, I was a medic in the service, and I've been in and around healthcare. I worked on an ICU when I got out. Um, and really, if it were up to me, I'd have a nurse evaluate it because they have more sense. Um, but systems, oh, here's a funny one, though. Okay, so it turns out you can train expert systems to spot cancers um, from x-rays and other imaging technologies. Um, but from photographs, the, the surest sign that, that uh, a lesion is malignant is if it's pictured next to a ruler. Right, just the size? Is that no. what you're saying? The fact that somebody put a ruler next to it to take a picture of it means it was probably, uh -oh. <laughs> and that somebody else decided it was malignant. Wow. Well, there yeah, you so are. You get weird anomalous stuff like that um, that you just have to pay attention to if, if you're doing this kind of work. Yeah, you know, I think about having a, a scan, for instance, or like I had a... Um, um, I guess they they scanned me to see if I had a hernia and and they said I didn't and then it turned out that I did. Yeah. And and you know the, I I've I've wondered if they had run that scan through an AI maybe it would have spotted the hernia. Quite possibly. Um like the, the the things that these machines are good at they're they're good at and it's it it's the kind of thing that's quantifiable to some extent like False negatives you find out about if you come back with a positive positive and, and you have sufficient record keeping to go back and say, okay, this is where we said this wrong and then you can adjust course. Um, some things you can't really do that with like hiring, um, a, a false negative, there is no test for that. There's no way to know if the person would have been a good fit or not. Uh, if if you don't hire them, there, and, and so these systems of hiring that companies like Google have, and, and they point with all their smugitude at how many successful hires they've had. And what they can't point to is how many good people they've missed and, and, and what they would have contributed. Um, and so that, that null data space, is it's, it's very easy to forget that that's a real thing uh, that you need to consider when you're doing cost benefit on you know whether these systems are helpful or not. Yeah, right. And when you're considering whether somebody's gonna be a good fit or not there's just so many variables that could play into that it yeah. would be hard to assess them all absolutely well my kid uh the younger kid went off to college this year and we were talking about different schools that he might go to and he you know kind of precociously pointed out like well, i can't really a b test my life so wherever I go, there will be things that are worse and things that are better than if I had gone somewhere else. But, you know, every place will have the value that it has, and I'll try and find that. Well, yeah, decisions are hard, aren't they? I know it. Yeah, damn. Let's do it, and I'll go back to having, you know, cocktails. I always thought of, of AI as, or whatever we want to call it, um, any kind of, like, computer computer intelligence that kind of can help you sort these things out is the decision support system, right? It doesn't yeah. make the decision, but it can help you, you know, it can inform the decision. Certainly at the level of complexity we can build today. Um, 
as an undergraduate, as a philosophy undergraduate at UT, I took a, a philosophy class on AI. And, and the professor, whose name I've forgotten, which is too bad, um, started the class with, um, instead of talking about, you know, Asimov's three laws or any other such fluff, he, he said, what would it take for you to believe that a machine felt pain? Um, and, and that annoyed me at the time. I thought, well, that's not a very practical question. And, and, you know, in the intervening decades, like we haven't made a general AI until we make something. And I like sadness better than pain personally, because I think it's a more comp complicated state. Like you could argue that, uh, the, you know, uh, whatever those worms are, they run through the mazes that they feel pain, even with their six neurons, because they turn away from the zap. But, but so we haven't really built anything that I would call an intelligence until we've built something with that kind of range of response that encompassed things like emotional states and not something that can do a trick like fool you that you're talking to a real person. Like we, we find agency so easily um, which is one of our heuristic tricks to, you know, survive in the world. Um, but we assign it very quickly. And, and so tricking us into assigning agency is not hard. It's a very are low there, bar. Are there things about uh, uses of AI that uh, make, gives you nightmares, perhaps things that, that frighten you, someone using it badly? Well, so, um, we've, seen how effective propaganda is and that goes back to how easy it is to manipulate people um and generative ai absolutely will let anyone we, we have democratized the generation of propaganda um and marketing i mean marketing is just sort of the most benign flavor of propaganda but it all amounts to the same thing manipulating people into doing things that they wouldn't otherwise want to do and if you use that for ill, because what you want to manipulate people into doing is hating somebody so that you can all get together and hate on them, and they'll do what you say so that you can hate on them together, then that's bad. Um, but it's not, it's not an AI problem per se. It's just a problem of humans getting along with other humans and the things they bring to bear. Um, marketers have had really excellent tools to sell me soda pop for a long time. Um, and this is just another tool, but I don't think it's a qualitative difference in our ability to manipulate each other. Makes it a little cheaper, makes it a little easier. In some ways that might be beneficial because people have exposure to how easy it is. I don't know. This is kind of a cheesy question. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you expect to ask in discussions like this, but I just have to ask it. What do you wish people understood better about AI? Hmm. That even though it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it really isn't a duck. Good point. Good point. By the way, I'm, I'm sitting here as we're talking and I'm seeing all those little buildings on the shelves behind you. I can't help but ask, what are those? Those are Lego. Um, are and, they? Yeah, I do Lego can, too. Let me see if I can switch to the other camera. Those are those are different from the ones that I've built. Okay. I've done a lot so, of Lego architecture. Yeah, and I'm looking at your shelf, thinking that looks a lot like this other shelf. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't really have any Lego in this room. Oh, I got a lot of it downstairs. The books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Legos for shelf space. So the Legos kind of go around this way. And then there used to be a piano there, but now there's just a pile of weird stuff. That's not a guillotine. It's a rowing machine. So I, I see one that I recognize. I see the Starry Nights back there. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's one of the good ones. It is. Um, anyway, these are Lego houses. This is not the bulk of the Lego collection. Yeah, the, the houses remind me of the old houses in San Francisco, old San Francisco. They are. Some of them um, have that very kind of San Francisco look to them, yes. Well, my question, my further question about that is that are those all from kits or did you, you know, Most did you do the thing? Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, my partner is, uh, you know, Bay Area Lego users group. She goes to the conferences and stuff like that. And a mock and MOC is, uh, 
initialism for something about making up your own stuff. Um, yeah. And so, um, mm-hmm. and, and we do a fair amount of that too. And typically like, uh, you know, the, the, this is not a pipe painting. Um, I guess it's a Magritte. Uh, I, know, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the joke is it's a picture of a pipe. It's not actually a pipe. So, so she made one that said, this is not a brick except in, you know, Danish. And, and then we made up a, a, a Lego model of a Lego brick. And I built a frame for that and motorized it. So this Lego, this giant fake Lego brick would rotate over the, the little sign. And that went to, you know, shows. That sounds pretty ambitious. I just get, I get the, architecture kits and, and I like build the architecture them. Kits. Uh, every once in a while like she'll trade a bunch of this kit for a bunch of that kit and she'll get something that's technics heavy like she got she bought this guy out who was moving and he sold like his whole lego collection and it more than filled our little tiny car and one of the things in there was the big earth mover kit where it's got the rotary shovel and the conveyor belts and stuff and so i built that uh, made sure all the pieces were there because it was it was out of the box. It was just a loose pile of bricks. And then I rebagged all the bricks. I reverse built it according to the instructions so that the bricks went in the right bags. Um, I can imagine Lego using AI to help create the designs and figure out the brick yeah, combinations are, and that uh, sort of thing. They have tools for that. You can use like Lego CAD is called um, Bricks IO maybe. And, oh, and wow. use it to generate parts lists and you can, and a lot of people in these Lego groups will model stuff out right now. She's working on, uh, she's doing, she's coordinating the group build for some big Lego show in a year or so. Um, that's going to be road trip USA. And her contribution to that is going to be the rock and roll hall of fame. Cause she's from Cleveland. Um, but in the meantime, she did a little one that was like, you know, this big. Um, that just I think my first, well, my first Lego kit was the New York skyline. Huh? And I was building it during the insurrection. I was building it as the Capitol was being attacked by a bunch of magas. Yeah, that'll, uh, that'll stick a thing in your head. Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, Kind of getting to that, so many people imagine that we now have some kind of fascist dictatorship forming uh, as as the new leadership of this country, and uh, how might they misuse AI? Well, uh, in a variety of ways. Um, One of the things about... uh, like a surveillance state um, is that lots of surveillance generates lots of data and it can be hard to, to do anything meaningful if you have too much data. People can hide down in there just by virtue of, you know, being named Bob Smith or whatever. Um, these tools are really very good at digesting lots of data and picking out the interesting bits. And so if you have lots and lots of surveillance data, um, then you're going to be able to do the kinds of uh, minority report stuff that Philip K. Dick was writing about and and predict people's uh disloyal behavior in a, in a way that makes it easier to find people who might be dissidents. And if you don't care about rights, then you just go whack people who might be dissidents. Um, and so it, that's, that's going to be a thing. I remember hearing that, I mean, one of the first uses of sort of like commuter information, like IBM, IBM was selling stuff to the Nazis and they were yeah. using it to track people, yeah. to track prisoners. Absolutely. And that, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of bureaucratic efficiency makes it easier to be efficient at your genocide. Like, that's what the Nazis were all about, is how do you cheaply genocide? And it turns out it's 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 a hard problem, um, but it's not as hard as it used to be. Yeah, the uh, 
license plate readers are, are a new thing in the Bay Area, not the Bay Area, in, in the Austin area. That's mm -hmm. really popular among all the law enforcement agencies. They want to get more and more and more. Yeah. And, and they all go into a central database. And I could see that being misused. Oh, absolutely. Like the 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 idea of, of moving around in a motor vehicle anonymously, that's kind of over. Um, and And so... You know, if you want to be anonymous, uh, you know, wear a hat and ride a bicycle and don't ride a weird bicycle, ride something that you got at Goodwill. Um, so you're, you're, know, don't carry a phone. Yeah, well, I know. go ahead. I was just say, I know that EFF Austin was involved in the uh, the Austin license plate reader thing. And uh I don't remember exactly how that came out, but I think that we got we got them to agree to put some restrictions on it. Um, but uh, Kevin Welch, who became our president, actually spoke against uh, resuming that license plate reader program at the city council. Yeah. And I should I know how all that turned out, but I don't really know. We should push back against all of these things at every opportunity we get to push back because like all of this is very much enabling technology for, um, you know, tighter controls on human behavior, which are generally bad um, for all of us. One of the reasons that uh, the license plate readers are so popular with law enforcement is the fact that uh, of the co the companies that build these have uh, offered them, you know, a very good sweetheart deal as long as they let them share the data with yes. their database that is not Absolutely. controlled by I, the police. That's a that's a there's another thing that I wish people knew about AI um, or NLP or any of these tools. Um, these statistical models are data hungry. Um, and so, so many things, and you know, Google search was, was all about gathering the data on what people are looking for so that you can sell them some things. Um, and, and so this, this hunger for data is, is that's not going to change because the more data you have, um, the more accurate your models are, whether you're using those models for good or ill, um, and so, yes, the license plate scanner companies don't really care one way or the other about LE, um, except buddying up with cops is always a thing to do in any fascist regime. Um, but the data that they get from that, and well, and, and back to your point about phones. Phones are like the ultimate personal monitoring, bugging, know what everybody is doing all the time. And now we have computers who can tell me if somebody's doing something I think is naughty. And it doesn't matter what I think is naughty. I can ask the computer to tell me about anybody and what they might be doing that I might or might not like. Um, and so anonymity is, is so going back to law, uh, privacy, we, we chose to enshrine the sort of principle that people ought to be allowed to do more or less whatever they want, absent evidence that it's harmful to other people. Um, we decided to protect that right to be let alone in privacy. So what, and, and under privacy law, I'm allowed to do anything that you're not supposed to know that I'm doing, which is a little bit different from I'm allowed to do what I want. Um, and so, and the idea behind privacy is that we need to keep our borderline activities secret um, in, in some way so that people aren't allowed to know that I'm doing it. So they're not allowed to tell me to stop doing it. That's a bit of a stretch. It, it, we would have been much better off if we had cut to the chase and said, unless you have evidence that this is, you know, socially harmful or to, to people who aren't doing it, then people can do whatever they want. Um, more or less, but that's not how any of that law is enshrined. And so as we, as secrets become harder and harder to keep, which they absolutely have done and will continue to do, um, because of these and, and other tools, um, then 
that right to be let alone gets thinner and thinner without anybody actually addressing that effect. Um, so when my phone uh, basically, and I do this because I want to, I, I decided pretty early on that privacy was kind of dead, uh, that keeping my activity secret was just never going to be viable because technology was just going to get so far ahead of that, that, you know, a lot of people would be able to know a lot of things about a lot of people. And, and there, it would be like a full-time avocation to try and keep myself unnoticeable or unnoticed. And, and it just wasn't worth the effort to me. Um, I may regret that in these uh, unprecedented times, uh, but it got me this far and I haven't spent a lot of time worrying about it. So I carry around my phone. I share my location with my kids. Um, I have, household devices that are no doubt listening to every word I say and thinking about what they can sell me the next time I log in. Um, and I just take that as the price of convenience. Yeah, I'm there too. I, I'm kind of on board with that. Uh, one thing that came out of this presidential campaign that I thought was kind of interesting, this was the, the Tim Walsh thing where he started saying, mind your own damn business, you uh -huh. know, kind of his message to the Republicans. And, um, I think we, you could build a movement around that, really. Mind your own damn business. Yeah, yeah. And that would be a more direct way to say, you know, leave me alone. I'm not bothering anybody. I'm over here doing my thing with my peeps and yeah, step out. That's what I think. That's what I think. Well, and, I think that's what all of us ultimately want. You know, the people who want to push people around are, you know, right now the bullies are ascendant. Uh, I mean, can you imagine an AI bully? Oh, yeah. Well, again, yeah. people are easy to manipulate with words. And so, and, you know, plenty of our favorite authors have written about these various manipulations. Uh, I went back and looked up that scene in Snow Crash where um, hero protagonist waltzes into a motorcycle dealership and social engineers himself onto a sweet ride. Just by knowing that. lots of stuff that you wouldn't expect to know. So um, I want to talk about AI as as a worker. You know, AI can do work that humans yeah. can do. Yeah. And this means that theoretically there could be a lot of people who now have jobs that will no longer have jobs because AI can do the job. Uh, I get from... from uh, hearing from you a little bit about it that your thought about that is okay well Absolutely. let's just put an end to capitalism yes let's just put an end capitalism is the problem there this idea that you have to earn your living is the most chilling thing i think i've ever heard it's like wait what i didn't ask to be here i didn't enter into this contract here i am and just by virtue of that i should be entitled to you know what human society can provide to all of us and so, and and for me, I think about, you know, what do you do about capitalism a lot? Because I don't like it a lot. And, and I think UBI is probably the step out of it that is easiest to implement because it's got fairly low barriers, uh, like cultural barriers. Um, it, every time we try it as an experiment, so many cultural metrics get better. It's like, it's the solution to petty crime. Oh, everybody has enough money to buy diapers. They don't need to shoplift diapers anymore. You don't, nobody buys diapers. You just go get the diapers. You can't hoard diapers in any meaningful way. If there's no diaper market, uh, you just need as many diapers as you need. And the same goes for food and medicine and education is, uh, is a social good. Like the, it, it's pretty easy to look around and say, you know, we're all going to be better off if we're all better educated. Uh, so education isn't a, private good for me it's like everybody's education is 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 good for me um but ubi makes a fairly easy first step there because if you do the real math it's it's cost positive instituting ubi at at any governmental level saves money in other parts of that government and it's cash flow positive um every experiment Which it's probably going to be a, kind of like social security. You know, when you get social security, right. you're not getting enough to support you. So well, you have to have su some supplement, right? Uh, well, I would disagree. I like 
the there is enough wealth right now in the world to lift everybody out of poverty and depending on what your other social services are countries that provide medical and housing and education to some degree instead of marketing those things the way we do here um are more efficient they it's just a better use of resources uh and so you know we spend a lot of resources on means testing um and and get worse results than if you didn't do any means testing at all plus we put a lot of people to work doing this kind of grim job of denying people benefits um so everybody wins if we stop implementing means testing systems uh and just handing out the money um solves a lot of problems. Uh, if you just hand out the money, then you have less fear around things that drives these bloody police budgets where we're basically paying this huge armed occupying force to oppress us uh, that's not really protecting us from things that wouldn't be much cheaper solved other ways. There's a guy named Elon something or other uh, that uh hangs around our neighborhood now, unfortunately, who's very cozy now with the uh, oncoming presidential uh, administration. Mm. And he is very much into having things, you know, run by, well, not necessarily AI, but programs. His robo taxis are the new big thing in uh, Musk world, apparently. He's given up on doing the cheap EV and doing only robo-taxis. And your area had uh, has had some bad experiences. With have, uh, I am more or less pro-robo-taxi. Um, like, uh, auto-driving cars, uh, right now, like are on par with a tired human and a lot of tired humans drive cars. Um, and you just, you need fewer cars. If what you have is a ride that shows up when you need it, that's not got a guy in it, who's going to hit on you and drops you off where you need to go. So secure rides point to point are, are an urban boon. And, um, and if you don't need to park them, that's another urban boon. And it's, the telemetry on these things is really more important than the sensors, um, but the telemetry and the sensors have gotten good. Uh, so if you have stretches of roadway that do not allow human drivers and instead all the cars um, are talking to each other with their telemetry, then all these cars can agree, we're gonna speed up and we're gonna slow down and you don't get traffic jams and everything just works better. So I think that what I, I, I despise the man um, when he sent his workers back to the Fairmont factory um, early in the COVID days. I divested. Um, I had bought some of that stock early uh, and, and I dumped it and thought for sure he would go out of business. That was wrong, uh, unfortunately. Um, but like that stock ended up paying for my older kid's college. Um, but like, I hate the guy. I hate everything he's doing. I hate the idea of privatizing things like NASA. That was my religion growing up. Uh, like we bought our first color TV so we could watch uh, the moon landing. Um, and and so seeing that turn into this capitalist pig fest has made me sad. Um, but yeah, as for the robo cars, like if you look at like cars right now, uh, <laughs> traffic safety right now is all you people around cars act safer so that the people in the cars don't have to. Um, and you know, I'm a cyclist um, and have been an urban cyclist since very early days. And, you know, I, I have made my peace with cars um, and I just basically go where they can't on the assumption that they want to run me over. So I treat them as adversarial road companions and don't let them um and Smart. So lost that game so far um but robo cars i think are gonna happen people are expensive robo trucks are absolutely gonna happen uh so truck driving that's not a job anymore uh for like any minute now um and and the same with rides uh so but robo rides uh 
with, you know, little buzzy EVs that don't necessarily even need to be big enough to have a driver's seat. You just sit in your little, you know, cafe bubble um, and the car takes you where you're going and you get in and you get out. And then the car just rolls around until it sits on its inductive pad and picks up some more power. Waymo. Thinking about the Waymo. Oh, yeah, we have Waymo is the one here. On the other hand, I also applaud the people who unicorn the Waymos here, which is where you put a road cone on the hood and the car loses its mind and it stops. Oh, wow. I wouldn't have thought of that. I know. Delightful. <laughs> That's a clever game. It is. Well, we are almost at the end of our hour here. What have we missed? What did we not talk about? Can't think of anything. Dog shows, kinky sex, cocktails. I, There's so much to talk about. That's the, that's the thing with people. Is there a cocktail was, AI? Uh, is there which? A cocktail AI. I mean, uh, so, uh, so funny story. Uh, my wife's boyfriend, um, they used to do robo games where you do the combats. Um, out here on the West Coast and the machines fight with each other, but then they also have ancillary things. Um, and there was a cocktail robot um, for making cocktails that he built and it had tubes and pumps and turrets. And uh, it, it wasn't necessarily AI driven, uh, but I can see opportunities there to, to feed in all these cocktail recipes and then say, okay, you know, I have chartreuse and i have this weird gin from you know oregon and and i have some luxardo cherries uh what can i do with that i'll buy one of those you know I, this made me think about it. lemore freed and phil tyrone were uh at south by southwest one year and they they decided to take a roomba and uh program it so that it could be like could play Frogger with the uh -huh. Roomba out in real traffic. That was pretty good. <laughs> that, that, good. that violates one of my rules about AI, though. Um, never hook up a computer with a radio to a motor, because that's how you get Skynet. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I know what my other question was going to be was whether uh, whether we can actually conceive of some artificial general intelligence. I, I think the answer is probably no. You think it's yes? Oh, yeah. But but it's still like it, if you look at the complexity of the human connectome um, and that runs on 20 watts uh, right now, that the whole of Earth compute is not as complex as one human brain. So we are still a long way off from any kind of AGI. You probably need a lot of power, too. Well, OK, like. like this does what it does on 20 watts. I mean, so obviously it's doable. It's just a question. We're just efficient, man. We're just really efficient. What can it's I say? Really efficient. We have been refined over a long time with a lot of remarkably stupid tricks that are mostly good enough. I mean, that's that's the whole game. Stupid tricks that are mostly good enough. I do think the brain is more limited than we often think it is, but oh, it that's is. another story. It is. Yes, I agree. So uh, this has been great. Jay, and I hope you will come back and visit us again. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. So I will let you know when this is published, and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Jay. Scoop, nice meeting you. John, always a pleasure to see you again. Yeah, we haven't seen each other in ages, have we? It has been a long, long, long time. Yeah, glad to reconnect. Really, really happy. Right on. See ya. Now. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.